We're coming in of a massive grid failure that has taken power out along the East Coast. So far, we have no confirmation on what is causing this devastating outage, but rumors of a cyber attack are already being mentioned by authorities. We now have reports that Texas has also lost its power in what appears to be a cascading domino effect. With as many as 100 million people now affected, authorities in the West are bracing themselves as they fear the blackout will continue to spread. It has been an extraordinary last hour. The entire East Coast went out, Texas followed, Officials confirmed a cyber attack is the most likely cause behind this catastrophic failure. Forgive me, I'm, I'm being told right now that Los Angeles, Las Vegas, and San Francisco, they have all gone out as well. It's looking like a total power outage across the entire country. A colossal and history-making blackout. The likes of which we have never seen before. What I'm talking about is a cyber attack against infrastructure, a cyber attack that could affect tens of millions of people for a period of months, if not longer. Based on your reporting, it seems clear from your book that the national security officials believe that this is a matter of when and not if. Exactly. In fact, that's a line that um, a uh, man I came to know when I was embedded with, with the U.S. forces during the invasion of Iraq. He is now the commander of CENTCOM, four-star general uh, Lloyd Austin, who said exactly that. It's not a question of if, it's only a question of when. We, we know, I say because the former chief scientist of the NSA told me this, as did Keith Alexander, his boss, who was the director of NSA. We know that the Russians are in the grid. We know that the Chinese are in the grid. It is frightening enough that uh, my wife and I decided we were going to buy enough freeze-dried food for all of our kids and their kids. In his book, Lights Out, veteran journalist Ted Koppel paints a grim picture of a paralyzing power outage in the form of an all-out cyber attack on the nation's electrical grid. Who are the potential perpetrators here? Who do we have to fear the most? Is it Russia, China, Iran, terrorists, yeah. uh, individual actors? All those. The interesting thing, Chip, is um, the ones who are most capable are the ones least likely to do it. There are some experts who say they're already in. Oh, they are in. They are in. There in. is no question about it. They're they, into our grid. They are already in the grid. I was told that by the former chief scientist of NSA. He stated categorically the Russians are in, the Chinese are in. The Iranians may be on the verge of getting in. And then at the bottom of the capability scale are folks like ISIS, terrorist groups. I spoke to the two top officials at FEMA. FEMA is the Federal Emergency Management Agency. It would be their responsibility to deal with the consequences uh, of an attack in the immediate aftermath. The, the deputy head of FEMA, who is a retired Coast Guard vice admiral, told me that, uh, in his opinion, uh, in the event that a city like New York or, or you know, the Manhattan was hit, uh, his response would be to evacuate. I said, evacuate 8 million people? Well, he said, you don't leave me with much, uh, much of an option. If it happens, you're going to take care, you've got to take care of the people, and the only way I can see you could do that would be to evacuate. Um, the next day, I spoke to his boss and said, what would you do? Would you evacuate? And he said, evacuate? You can't evacuate 8 million people. Where would you put them? So uh, just to respond directly to your question, the two top people at the agency responsible for dealing with the consequences of an attack like this cannot agree on what they would do.
So we turned to Paul Stockton, a former Defense Department official whose duties included cybersecurity. So what does the average family actually need to be doing? Do they need to be, as Ted Koppel has done, stocking up on water and freeze-dried food? I think those are very important uh, measures. Average citizens need to be able to take care of their own families and their own neighborhoods and their own communities and not assume that Uncle Sam is somehow going to magically bring in the cavalry and rescue them. Are the power companies today prepared to respond to a large-scale cyber attack on the grid? Power companies today are strengthening their ability to respond to an attack and restore power more quickly. Still, Stockton admits. Their readiness is not where it needs to be, given that the adversary continues to strengthen the sophistication of the weapons that will be used against the United States. Um, but uh, to, to have an extra supply of food and water, uh, to be able to take care of your family and to know uh, that you're not dependent upon government sort of running to the rescue, uh, I think that can actually be quite healthy. Well, having written the book, I should ask you directly, how prepared are you now? Uh, not as prepared as I should be, but I, I have bought some freeze-dried food for the family, for myself and my wife and uh, our children and our grandchildren. Uh, we do have a, a water supply and we do have backup generators. Uh, is that going to be sufficient? Um, I don't know. I, uh, I hope never to find out, but I fear that I may. So let's ask you directly, um, given what you now know about this subject, over the next 10 years, what would you put the likelihood at that something like this will happen? Well, if, if I didn't think that it was likely, I wouldn't have written the book in the first place. Uh, I think over the, I mean, when you say over the next 10 years, I think it's all but inevitable that it's going to happen in the next 10 years. You're talking about a community of, what, 8 million people? The food in a place like Manhattan would run out in a couple of days. New York State has several million MREs, meals ready to eat. But when you take several million and you divide it by 8 million, you're talking about maybe a two or three day food supply. Mm. What happens on day four? But you go into considerably more detail in your book, and perhaps you can share some of that with us now. What would happen, in fact, if this did take place? Well, uh, you know, once you're without electricity, you are without the capability of, I mean, particularly if you live in an urban center, you're without the capability of heating or cooling your home. Uh, the, uh, the water supply is going to stop in the sense that it requires pumps, which are powered by electricity to get that water into the various apartment buildings, into the flats throughout the city. Uh, the worst part about that is not merely the fact that there wouldn't be enough drinking water available, but also the fact that you don't have the capability of disposing of human waste. Within the matter of just a few days, that becomes a major crisis. I spoke to an official of one state that is a, a rural state, only a few hours drive from Washington, who told me that the governor had a, in effect, they did sort of a war game. And they, they have told the National Guard, the state police, the local sheriff's departments, that what they're going to be doing in the event of something like this and tens of thousands of refugees coming from Washington, they will be handed a bottle of water, a sandwich, and a map. And the map will show them where the nearest gas station is. And they will be told, I'm terribly sorry, we do not have the infrastructure to support tens of thousands of refugees. Uh, and I must tell you that in the final analysis, I came 
you know, we all have to reach a conclusion at some point or another. When you read the book or when you get other information on the subject, you may reach a different conclusion. Uh, I, am, I am convinced that this can happen, and I am more or less convinced that at some point or another it's going to happen in one form or another. It is frightening enough that uh, my wife and I decided we were going to buy enough freeze-dried food for all of our kids and their kids. A serious warning from top national security experts. They say an electromagnetic pulse attack, also known as an EMP, could be devastating. It could easily damage the country's critical infrastructure, especially the electrical grid. Peter Vincent Pry, the executive director of the Electromagnetic Pulse Task Force and Advisory Board uh, on National and Homeland Security, is joining us now. He just wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal documenting the threat to melt the electric grid, which is enough to get our attention, Dr. Pry. Nice to have you on the program. Well, thank you so much for having me. You have quite uh, the resume of experience. You worked as an intelligence officer for the CIA. You focused specifically as well your career on this threat. When you look at what's facing our nation right now, why is this of such great concern to you? Uh, because it is the greatest threat that our nation and Western civilization faces. You know, it was deeply classified throughout most of the Cold War. And only after the EMP commission reports declassified much of the information about EMP that it become publicly known. And so it is one of the least understood threats, and yet the greatest threat that we face. You know, because if a terrorist organization, or North Korea, or Iran, detonated just a single nuclear weapon, a single nuclear weapon at high altitude over the United States, you know, it would destroy the electric grid and our critical infrastructures, and put at risk the lives of up to 90% of the American people. You know, we all depend, directly or indirectly, we all live directly or indirectly off of electricity. We're an electronic civilization. And it's also a threat from nature, you know, because there is such a thing as a geomagnetic superstorm. They've happened in the past in 1859 and 1921, and NASA, they're inevitable. It's going to happen again someday. Uh, there was a NASA report in uh, last year that said that, a, uh, that we just barely missed by three days being hit by a geomagnetic superstorm back in 2012. And when that happens, it could take out electric grids and the critical infrastructures that support life. The threat of a terror attack is one that needs to be taken seriously now. So says my next guest, former United States Ambassador and former Director of the CIA, James Woolsey. Uh, Ambassador, thanks for being with us and the CIA. You know firsthand how many enemies we have out there. What do you think is the biggest threat to our grid? Uh, they could launch a uh, satellite with a simple nuclear weapon in it. Uh, they, best if they launch it uh, around the southern pole, uh, because we don't have any defenses and, and very little warning uh, down there. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, while it's in orbit, uh, just uh, detonate it. And this could be a very simple nuclear weapon, similar to what we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It doesn't have to be sophisticated at all. It doesn't need any accuracy. You're not trying to hit anything on the ground. You're just detonating a nuclear weapon up uh, 30 miles or so uh, in space. Uh, that would take out the grid for probably a quarter to a third of the United States. And if you detonated it up at a couple of hundred miles, it would take out the grid for most of the United States. And why don't we have the defenses in the southern part, uh, and I talked about this in the open, in the southern part of our, our nation, so that a satellite could come in and could be detonated. I mean, it doesn't have to even be specific. What, why are there no missile defenses down there? Uh, I guess I would say, if I were being uh, flippant, that uh, uh, we've turned uh, over defending the country's electric grid uh, to people with the uh, f overall focus of ostriches. Uh, nobody really wants to do anything on this in the federal government except uh, stick their heads in the sand. Uh and Ambassador, do, do you think that the power plants across the country have the protection that they need? No, absolutely not. Uh, nuclear power plants, uh, particularly uh, uh, if hit by an electromagnetic pulse, uh, 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 would uh, melt down uh, before too long, and uh, you'd have uh, disasters emanating from the nuclear power plants as well as from a lot of other sources. If, if you take out by taking down the, the, the grid, if you take out uh, the electrical system, 
Everything else goes down, too. We have 18 critical infrastructures in the country, and 17 of them depend on electricity. So you lose your communication system, you lose transportation, you lose uh, your bank uh, teller uh, system for getting money. Uh, nothing works. And you were the head of the CIA. Our yes. enemies know all this, correct? I'm afraid they do. Uh, the Russians uh, have told us that they, back in the early 90s, uh, told the North Koreans a great deal about how to uh, use an electromagnetic uh, pulse uh, detonation. Um, the Ir Iranians and the uh, North Koreans have both orbited satellites to the south, and the North Koreans have tested several uh, simple uh, nuclear weapons. The uh, Iranians haven't uh, yet, but probably will uh, before too many months go. So um, we have at least two um, very bad states tied very closely to terrorist groups and the rest. Uh, that could be ideologically crazy enough uh, to uh, try something like this. And, yeah. and you know, you don't need to uh, a satellite. Uh, you, uh, you, can, you can lift a nuclear weapon quite easily with a, with a weather balloon up into low Earth orbit and detonate it. That's all that's needed. For the past few months now, the nation's top military, intelligence, and law enforcement officials have been warning Congress and the country about a coming cyber attack against critical infrastructure in the United States that could affect everything from the heat in your home to the money in your bank account. The warnings have been raised before, but never with such urgency, because this new era of warfare has already begun. The first attack, using a computer virus called Stuxnet, was launched several years ago against an Iranian nuclear facility, almost certainly with some U.S. involvement. But the implications and the possible consequences are only now coming to light. And then, one day in 2009, without a bomb being dropped or troops on the ground, the plant in Iran was dealt a blow. The agent of destruction? A computer virus, codenamed Stuxnet. And it turned out to be the largest act of cyber sabotage in world history. If you were in that room, you would literally die. You would not want to be in that room when this happened. Eric Chen is a computer virus expert who's been analyzing cyber threats for the last 15 years. He's one of the few people on the planet qualified to discern what actually happened. How big a deal is Stuxnet? I, I don't think there's ever been anything bigger. You know, the closest thing that's been bigger is maybe the advent of the internet. Chen works for Symantec in Los Angeles. It's one of the largest information security providers in the world. The company's team was instrumental in cracking Stuxnet. And what they learned will change the way countries approach warfare in the future. Stuxnet has basically demonstrated to the world that it's possible to take computer code and cause physical real world damage. Stuxnet crossed over from the virtual world to the real one. The operation was so sophisticated Chen and his team estimated it took more than 20 high-level programmers with inside knowledge of the plant at Natanz. This is not two hackers in a basement in Kansas somewhere. When we know from the code and the sophistication and the amount of effort that needed to go into it, it had to have the resources at the level of a nation state. And in fact, the New York Times reported in January that Stuxnet was likely a joint project between the Americans and the Israelis. It's not a particularly shocking conclusion considering that Israel has made little secret of its willingness to attack Iranian nuclear facilities by conventional military means. Stuxnet may have given them the opportunity they've been waiting for without having to even fire a shot. But if it was them, they're not talking. The Israeli government did not respond to our request for comment on who created Stuxnet. We didn't have much more luck with the U.S., but U.S. involvement in Stuxnet may have been cagely winked at. Like when President Obama's representative on weapons of mass destruction spoke at a conference on Iran back in December. I'm glad to hear they're having problems with their centrifuge machines, and I think that uh, you know the U.S. and its allies are doing everything we can to try to make sure that uh, that we complicate matters for them. Such as launching a cyber attack against critical infrastructure here in the United States. Until last fall, Sean McGurk was in charge of protecting it as head of cyber defense at the Department of Homeland Security. 
He believes that Stuxnet has given countries like Russia and China, not to mention terrorist groups and gangs of cyber criminals for hire, a textbook on how to attack key U.S. installations. You can download the actual source code of Stuxnet now, and you can repurpose it and repackage it and then you know, point it back towards uh, wherever it came from. Sounds a little bit like Pandora's box. Yes. Whoever launched this attack. They opened up the box, they demonstrated the capability, they showed the ability and the desire to do so, and it's not something that can be put back. If somebody in the government had come to you and said, look, we're thinking about doing this, what do you think? What would you have told them? I would have strongly cautioned them against it because of the unintended consequences of releasing such a code. Meaning that other people could use it against you? Yes. Or use their own version of the code? Something similar. Son of Stuxnet, if you will. As a result, what was once abstract theory has now become a distinct possibility. If you can do this to a uranium enrichment plant, why couldn't you do it to a, a nuclear power reactor in the United States or an electric company? You could do that to those facilities. It's not easy. It's a difficult task, and that's why Stuxnet was so sophisticated, but it could be done. You don't need many billions. You just need a couple of millions. And this would buy you a decent cyber attack, for example, against the U.S. power grid. If you were a terrorist group or a failed nation state and you had a couple of million dollars, where would you go to find the people that knew how to do this? On the Internet. They're out there? Sure. Most of the nation's critical infrastructure is privately owned and extremely vulnerable to a highly sophisticated cyber weapon like Stuxnet. I can't think of another area in Homeland Security where the threat is greater and we've done less. After several failures, Congress is once again trying to pass the nation's first cybersecurity law. And once again, there is fierce debate over whether the federal government should be allowed to require the owners of critical infrastructure to improve the security of their computer networks. Whatever the outcome, no one can say the nation hasn't been warned. Cyber attack scenarios against critical infrastructure have been a concern for the Department of Homeland Security at least since 2007, when the agency commissioned an experiment called Aurora. The question experts wanted to answer was a simple one. Could a purely digital cyber attack disrupt or disable a large generator connected to the power grid? I was the director of the Control Systems Security Program at the Department of Homeland Security. And during that time, I ran the, the project that many people are familiar with called Aurora. A team of electrical engineers brought a 27-ton heavy-duty diesel generator to a specially built testing facility at the Idaho National Lab. After connecting the generator to the power grid, they challenged a team of computer security experts to use computer code to knock the generator offline. The test was monitored via closed circuit TV. In the video, you'll see it running, humming along normally. And then you see the first hit. The first jump. Uh, you see the, the generator shudder. The jump occurred almost immediately after the attackers sent the first packet of malicious computer code. We wanted to hit it and then wait and collect data and see what was happening. And then hit it again, collect some data, and kind of watch the progression of the, the damage to the generator. After the second attack, the generator lurched again, belched ominous smoke, and ground to a halt. Not only was it knocked off the grid, it was rendered completely inoperable. What they found when they opened the generator was just failures with almost all parts of the generator, both mechanical and electrical. So what you're really talking about is essentially what you would do with pieces of dynamite. So this was a tough machine. This was heavy duty and it was designed to run in severe conditions. If you were actually doing that attack, there's no reason to pause and, and wait in between. You simply 
put your software on a loop and you just keep hitting it until it breaks. An attack like this could take less than a minute, but leave consequences that would last for months. If you damage or destroy these, you can't just go down to your neighborhood hardware store and buy another. It could take you maybe six to nine months to get another one of these. And according to a government study, a coordinated attack on fewer than a dozen power stations could cause a massive outage. And an update on a story we brought you yesterday. A top former energy official claims an attack on an American power grid was terrorism. One or more snipers opened fire in April, knocking out 17 transformers that send power to California's Silicon Valley. Officials moved the flow of electricity to another site to stop a blackout. But the man who chaired the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission at the time tells CBS News it could be an omen for a future attack. We have risks on physical security that were evidenced by this attack that have not yet been addressed that need to be addressed, in my opinion, immediately. Let's take a look at the U.S. Right, so let's start with the domestic threat, Brian. Here we have the United States. Just looking at this calendar year, first nine months, the black states are where we have intercepted, picked up ISIS terrorists. And the really disturbing thing is that's January to September. Let's just add up to November. We've got four more states, including places like Kentucky, Ohio, where we're arresting ISIS terrorists here. What I find astounding is we think uh, Orlando was the last hit. We right. think that San Bernardino was one of the first re recently. But right. you're saying... These have all been avoided because our guys right. and our, our, our men and women have been picking it up. Yeah, let's look at the, the gross numbers. Since the caliphate was declared just two and a half years ago from Mosul, we have killed or arrested 124 ISIS terrorists here in America. Not 24, right. not 34, 124. And as you can see, it's distributed.